Um, I'm Cheryl Hauser, the uh, co-director and producer of Generation Startup, the film you're about to see. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you so much to uh, Bloomberg and, and Cornell Tech at Bloomberg for having us here. Um, this is a film that celebrates risk-taking and innovation and also very much celebrates entrepreneurship as the uh, driver of economic rejuvenation of cities. So it's very fitting that we're here at Bloomberg to see the film. Um, you know, he is one of the great entrepreneurs uh, of our day and also very much understands the importance of entrepreneurship uh, to create jobs and, and build and rebuild cities. Um, who in the audience thinks that entrepreneurship is thriving among millennials? It's a lot of the audience. Um, you'll be surprised to learn that entrepreneurship is at a 25-year low among 18 to 30-year-olds. This generation is very risk-averse. There are a lot of reasons for it. Um, so um, the movie, I got drawn to telling the stories in the film um, because I had, at age 52, finally worked up the courage to launch my own company. And I had just launched my own multi-platform production company. And my um, eldest son was a fellow in a program called Venture for America. Um, Andrew Yang, who will be on the panel after the screening, launched Venture for America in 2011 because he saw the crisis that we were in, that young people were not joining com uh, launching companies. They were taking much more conventional paths, for the most part. Um, investment banking, uh, law school, uh, you know, uh, consulting, a lot of other m more secure uh, paths. And he said, what can I do? Um, he was a successful entrepreneur. Um, who had gone to law school and wasn't happy practicing as a lawyer and, and um, had worked at several startups that didn't succeed and then um, launched one that did, and he can speak more about that. But he said, what can I do? And he said, I I'm going to uh, create uh, this organization and find uh, college seniors and pair them with startups around the country uh, in economically depressed cities and they'll train for two years with these startups. The startups will hire them and pay them, and they'll learn what it is to be an entrepreneur, and then Venture for America will help them launch their own companies, ideally in the cities where they've been uh, placed. So my son was um, a Venture for America fellow, and because he was an English major, um, was put in charge of a lot of marketing at a rapidly growing uh, startup and was really floundering and having a hard time because he, he didn't know what he was doing, but he was learning it as he went. And um, I was just launching my own company and kind of feeling the same way, but was so in awe of these young people who were taking risks um, when they had far less experience than I had. And I met Andrew and I said, I'd like to follow some of your fellows in one of your cities. And he was game, and I then attached Cynthia Wade as my co-director. Um, my co-producer, Brian Egan, is, is here tonight as well. And then we had to pick what city to film in. Venture for America was in 12 cities at the time. And we, it just seemed like there were exciting things happening in Cleveland and Baltimore and Providence and Cincinnati and, and a lot of these cities. But Detroit is like the grand mommy, granddaddy of them all. I mean, it a, a, was our fourth fourth largest city in the 1950s and very much built on entrepreneurship and innovation and um, had also fallen the farthest. So we decided it's also a very visually rich city and film is a visual medium. So um, we decided that we would follow Venture for America fellows in Detroit. Um, when we started filming in 2014, Detroit was uh, in bankruptcy. Detroit's very much a character in this film. Um, it changed so much in the year and a half we filmed. So we filmed for a year and a half with six Venture for America fellows, all recent college graduates. Some are launching startups. Some have already gone through the two years of having worked for a startup in Detroit and are launching their own companies. Others are just arriving in Detroit and joining the startup ecosystem in Detroit. But um, as you'll see, they all were clueless when they started out. They floundered, they failed, they hit rock bottom, and they all figured 
figured it out. And for me, this is what this movie is about more than anything else. It's about how we all have to move outside our comfort zone and take risk. And that's how we learn and grow and evolve as humans. And that's also how we build anything meaningful. So enjoy the film and look forward to seeing you uh, after the film. I've never built a company before. I'm 24 years old. Certainly often feel like I'm in over my head. I don't know what I'm doing, and it makes me extremely nervous. What keeps me up the most is like, am I really, as a person, capable of building this company? You so badly wish that I wasn't working at a startup, right? But it's kind of do you think that people should do what makes them happy? Uh, no. The risk of failure is so high that there's a good chance that I'm investing years of my life in things that will ultimately fail. To start a company, you have to be crazy. None of us had any experience. I might have taken on more than I can handle. I work 18, 20 hour days. I fail multiple times a day. We live out of a motel. Hello? We only had three weeks of money left. Just about everything you can imagine went wrong. We made 18,000 pounds of bad product. Oh my God. If we don't have a product, we don't have a company. We're in this. Like, we jumped off the cliff. Like, there's no going back. So, like, I have to do it or die trying. For me, it always comes back to you have to play the game to change it. 90-something percent of startups fail. I'm just going to make it my number one priority not to. Have you heard of Bonza? They're really good. When you buy three, you get hugs. Oh, thank you so much. Being a startup founder, it's about building something and getting somewhere. You should fix your hair, by the way. <laughs> I guess it's better. You start to realize everything is going to seem terrifying, but you'll figure it out one step at a time. There's no ceiling. There's always more room to grow and more room to achieve. It's surprised me what being passionate about something can change a gear within myself or anybody else, really. I definitely did not see any of this coming. You all knew each other throughout this whole uh, experience, right? I mean, you guys talked to each other and you were able to compare notes when you were in Detroit. Yeah. Um, you hung out, right? We hung out. We went to the same house parties and we went to the same <laughs> bars. Uh, these were people who were our friends and, and Venture for America is a pretty close-knit group in the cities that you end up in. So I knew all the people in those films um, and actually it was part of the inspiration and motivation to start a company eventually because when you see people you know from the house party last Friday doing it, it seems much more doable. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let me get straight to the question I had uh, for Labib, which is did you tell your parents what happened? <laughs> um, I told my parents. Uh, I waited until the week before the documentary came out to tell them because I, it was just too much of a thing to, to not do until the last minute. Um, it didn't go very well at first. Um, my mom started crying. She kept saying, why are you throwing us away? My dad became very quiet. And then he came back into the room and he said, you know, my relationship with you is over. And we, had, we went back to, to Yonkers to tell them, and they packed all of the stuff that we had in the house and, and, and put us in the car and, and drove us to Manhattan, where we live now, and dropped us off. And we thought, you know, that was it. Um, and then three weeks later, my dad called, and, and he, you know, tried to start arguing, as, as he does, as you've seen. Um, and then finally, after an hour, um, you know, my mom and my dad were both, you know, they said, crying, like, we're, we're too unhappy without you in our lives, we will please come home um, this weekend. And so we went back home that weekend and you know, many weekends since. And now you know, one of my problems is you know, my mom asking me when I'm going to get married. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, things, so things, things, are, things are at, a, at a, like a nice, comfortable, you know, we, we have relationships. 
So that's good, better than you expected. Yes, much better than I expected. So one thing I thought was interesting, when Cheryl introduced the film, um, Andrew, she said that um, millennials have this low rate of starting companies. Entrepreneurship uh, for those from 18 to 25 is at a 25 year low. Uh, this is a generation that's risk averse, perhaps because of the financial crisis. Do you consider yourself a risk taker or are you risk averse? I mean, you started- Me personally? <laughs> yeah, you started Venture for America. You had, what, you trained as a lawyer, right? Yes. And you decided to start this company, it seems like a little bit on a lark. Uh, well, you know, just, I mean- <laughs> Are you just disputing this, that? <laughs> because anyone who starts a company on a lark is, um, you know, uh, prob probably doesn't know what they're, they're getting into. Um, you know, I grew up Asian, I'm still Asian today. Um, <laughs> but, the <laughs> so there are certain expectations, are you saying? You know, I, I started thinking that the risk was more that I would never do anything rather than the risk being that I would starve. And, and that's true for just about everyone here in this room where starvation is really not going to happen to you. Uh, you know, it's just like there's a, a range of um, paths and outcomes and, and trajectories. And so for me at the time I was, so I started a company that flopped in my mid-20s. Um, and I, I didn't have a girlfriend. I was like, I don't have a mortgage, I don't have kids, so if I don't do this now, I'm never gonna do this, was my, my thinking. And then when that company flopped, it certainly was, was really difficult for me, but then you get a little bulletproof. Mm -hmm. And to your point about um, people now starting businesses at lower rates than they, they have in, in past generations, um, I had the benefit of really just falling flat on my face in my mid-20s, and I was like, oh, it can't be that bad. Like, you know, like no, no one, I joked that I had a net worth of negative $100,000, but no one knows that unless you tell them. And, like, <laughs> and I would never tell anyone. So, uh, so that one of the things that Venture for America tries to do is put people in position where they experience adversity and then they realize that they'll be okay. Uh, and so uh, what, I think that's what we need. I'm a parent now myself, that we just need to show our uh, younger people that it's going to be okay and that it's okay to put yourself out there and maybe even you know, skin your knees a, a little bit early on. Well, Kate, I mean, it sounds like you've done pretty well. You moved from Detroit Labs to founding Flock, and Women Rising is still very much uh, your marquee product. Did you fail at all in, during this experience in, in, in trying to launch your own startup? Did you? Uh, <laughs> yes. So the first company that I tried to launch was not Women Rising. It was Assembly of Commerce, which you haven't heard of because zero people joined it. Uh, <laughs> what was it so the, supposed to do? The whole idea was to connect small business owners to share resources. Like I thought it would be a way for you know you to share tools or an accountant or whatever it was. I've never been a small business owner. I didn't know any small business owners. It just seemed like the right thing to do hypothetically. So I started it, raised six thousand dollars, and not a single from crowdfunding, which was great. Um, and it turns out everyone donated aspirationally because everyone likes to help small businesses, but none of us knew what we were talking about and no small businesses wanted to join this platform. So that was hugely embarrassing. Uh, and not only did it not work, I had also taken a bunch of my friends' money, which was even more mortifying. So I took a step back and said, I don't know what to do now. And one of my mentors said, the good news is people donated to this because they like you, not because they really cared about your product. So just do something better with it. Um, and I started to think about what's the consumer that I know best, and it was women in technology. So we shifted to Women Rising, and then that's how that grew. And it has to be something you're passionate about because you're going to spend 24-7 building this thing. And as the film makes clear, most of that work is not fun. It's not enjoyable. It's hard work. It's not sexy. And you're doing it by yourself. Yeah, yeah. And there's a tremendous amount of stress. that It's hard to communicate what it means. Um, and I think that I didn't even understand it until Women Rising became Flock. And I stepped away from having a full-time job. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, my ability to pay rent three months out was going to be dependent on this working. And you can't, you can't, it's, it's hard to imagine that stress until you're really in the moment. And so it really needs to me, it needs to mean something to you in order to really put yourself through that. Well, Abib, you founded a company that means a lot to you. Describe it at the end. It connects, you know, your family and your, your own background with what you want to do with your need to start a new company. Where is that? Give us an update. Sure. So I, I, when I came back to New York, I, I asked myself whether it was uh, the right time to be, to be doing it, and I put it on hold um, for three reasons. Um, one is the current administration is not the best time to be going around with the message of cross-border trade and helping you know, create jobs in, in places that are not America. 
Um, the second reason, and, and this is the biggest one, is I realized that selling into complex business-to-business -business markets actually requires you know, a lot of, a, a, a broad range of skills that I just did not have um, at that point in time. And so I went and joined uh, a B2B SaaS company as a product manager to go and pick up those skills instead. And, and that's sort of what I'm doing right now. Um, the third reason is that you know, a, a, a startup trying to start something kind of very quickly grows to encompass all of your energy. And I felt that there were things that I needed to figure out before I dedicated that to my startup. So whether it was the emotional resilience of handling my relationship with my parents and, and telling them and, and having to navigate all of that, or just figuring out how to continue to grow intellectually and, and learn more. Um, so I prioritized all kind of because of those three things, I decided to put it on hold until I figured those out. Do you think you started VFA as a VFA fellow with rose-colored glasses thinking this will work out, somehow it'll all work out and it's, it's going to be a good thing for me? Yeah, I, I definitely went in with the naivete that you know, a sufficiently smart systems-driven person could theoretically tackle every challenge if they just dedicated themselves to it. And you know, that, that may be true, but I realized how in all of the ways that it's not true and how much uh, I needed to grow. So I, I definitely went in um, assuming I had more abilities than I actually did. Andrew, you kept in touch with these guys throughout the year and a half. Um, sure. What did you see the most? What changes did you see the most and what surprised you in, in ca catching up with them each time? You know, uh, I love seeing them grow and mature. You can probably even see it in the film a little bit, right? Where you see them in the beginning and then they... So uh, I feel like I've watched, uh, you know, at this point, several hundred young people become... Um, adults, better versions of themselves, managers, leaders. Um, not to say that starting a company is the end-all be-all because there are many forms that mm -hmm. uh, people's paths take. Uh, but certainly Kate and Labib and Dextina and uh, Brian and everyone else in the film um, represent a path that Venture for America as an organization um, really dedicates a lot of heart and soul to, which is trying to help people find what they want to build and, and create in the world and then help them, them do that. Um, the, the thing that I, I say to people is like, um, if you want people to start companies, what you really want to have is you just want to have very, very uh, self-actualized, confident people and then hope that they start companies. You know what I mean? It's like, like the company is the outgrowth of the person. And so what you really want to do is you want to develop the person. And that goes for everyone here in this room too. It's like a lot of you have things that you'd like to see in the world. A lot of you have thought about starting businesses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you know, it, it's, as Kate said, it's like a very difficult, stressful process, but it, it ends up helping you grow. And, and that's the thing that we as an organization want to see as many people experience as possible. Well, you were quoted as saying, not in the film per se, but I read elsewhere that uh, the subjects in the film are living proof that entrepreneurs are made, they're not born. If that's the case, what do you think you need to be equipped with, though, to be a successful entrepreneur? Is it that confidence, or is it un an unfailing sense of optimism? What's that, that quality? Uh, I think persistence is a lot of it, that you head down a path. And as Labib said, it's like you really don't know what your path's going to lead to. But then you get beaten up some, and then you're like, OK, that did not work the way I thought it was going to work. But I learned this one or two things, and let me go in that direction. And then you just like, be like, OK, and you just keep on grinding forward, then if you stick with it long enough, uh, I remember when I started Adventure for America, it was a PowerPoint deck, and I was just like, hey, we're going to train these young people, we're going to send them, you know, it was like, pe some people were like, oh, that's a great idea, but a lot of people were like, that sounds impossible. <laughs> and uh, it was like 2010. Uh, and, uh, and then here we are, and now, like, there's this incredible film that Cheryl and Brian made and everything else. So, like, I I've seen uh, things become real. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, but it, it's really just through persistence and grinding away, like uh, you know, the, all of this unsexy work you do in the background, so that occasionally, um, you know, people get excited about what you're doing. One thing that I found remarkable about the film is that it's not about a bunch of white guys. Um, there are certainly white guys in the movie, but the spotlight really shines on different kinds of people with different backgrounds. Kate, um, entrepreneurship is different, right? When you're not a white guy, it's w with a lot of privilege. What's the distinction of being a woman trying to be an entrepreneur in a city like Detroit that's gone through its struggles and is hard for anyone? Mm -hmm. um, I think the perception of you is different. I think the, the words people use to describe you are different. 
I think that when you act a certain way as an entrepreneur or a leader must as a male, you are called a leader or a visionary or isn't it so cool what they're building. When you're a woman and you act that way, they call you aggressive and they call you bossy and they don't like you. And that's, it's something that we've, we've seen, right? Is like when women are running for higher positions than they had before, we like them less. And then once they're in that position and succeeding, oh my gosh, we love them so much. But when you're running for that, or when you're you know, getting to that next step, people like you a lot less. Mm -hmm. um, and I definitely felt some backlash from friendships even that I had in Detroit. Really, how so? Yeah, I, yeah. Okay, <laughs> well, how about this? There's, there is a gender perception where when a woman says she's gonna change the world and, and build something, a lot of people quickly assume that that means she's gonna build a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Whereas for guys, when he says he's gonna change the world, he's likely to get financing because he's gonna maximize the profit potential. Have you felt this firsthand? Do you see it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, even with what I'm working on now with Flock, I am asked consistently why we're not a nonprofit. I think it's much more expected for women to do this like feel good for the planet, like bring everyone together thing. And Flock is one of those things, but we're also gonna make money because we're a for-profit company. And when you as a woman are like, I'm gonna make money, people again, they, they just don't like you as much. But and do so, they back off or they say, really, are you sure that's what you wanna do? Or I, I've had it suggested to me so many times to be a nonprofit instead of a for-profit. I, I don't know if any, did you, have you ever gotten it suggested that you should go for a nonprofit route? All the time. Okay, so maybe yeah. it's not a gender thing. It's, no, it's, it's either gender or global development. Like those are the two things that are, oh, this should be a, a nonprofit thing that you feel good about. Why are you thinking about this at scale? Mm -hmm. But that wouldn't have happened if it was Mason, right? I mean, Mason is clearly a for-profit enterprise. Um, no one asked, oh, this should be a nonprofit, or are you a nonprofit? Yeah, but that's because Mason has no messaging around trying to make China a better, more industrious place. Like, I have messaging around <laughs> trying to make Bangladesh a better, more, more industrious place. Maybe you shouldn't place. have that as your message. Yeah, I, I, I've thought about that. But, but to, to answer your question about what it's like, you know, not being a white guy in, in this world, the, the first thing is there's a tendency to sort of bucket people like me on the, on the technical end of things. Like, there's this inherent thing, like, South Asian male, studied engineering in school, this is the person who's going to write code. And you know, I can write code well enough to whip up an entry level application, but, but my skills are, are better served kind of communicating the idea of the business and, and trying to think about the, the strategy. No one will ever automatically jump to that conclusion and I have to work to prove myself and use very specific language mm -hmm. and code myself in a very specific way uh, in order to get people to reframe me away from engineering founder to like this and overall founder is going to do things. That's one thing. The second thing is my risk profile is, is completely different. I think many people have the privilege of if the startup doesn't work out and they can't make rent money uh, and they don't have insurance, well, you know, they can just go back and live, live with their parents for a little bit. Um, most of my friends are still under their parents' health insurance because that's how it works. You're under the, your health, parents' health insurance until you're 26 years old. And for, for me, for now, for me, it's the complete opposite. Um, I don't, I cannot depend on my parents to be that safety net. Um, if I, and to go further, because my parents are now unable to support themselves entirely, I actually have to, my risk calculus is, do I have this much money after all of my expenses to send to my parents every month? Um, and that, that changes everything in terms of what risks that you think you can take because it's not just, I don't, it is not enough for me to think, you know, I'll be okay, I can crash with, the, for, so, with some friends and they'll feed me. It is also, I need, if I don't support my parents, they're, they're in a lot of trouble. And so that, that calculation is completely different. Andrew, do, are there a lot of people, a lot of VFA fellows who go and look to, to found nonprofits or is it all for-profit businesses? Many, many nonprofits. Uh, so this is not, this is, <laughs> this is gonna sound like I'm doubling down something I, I would say, but um, about half of our fellows are women, 18% black and Latino. Uh, and so people get into Venture for America for a variety of, of reasons uh, around trying to improve the world. Mm -hmm. And I 100% I think both of your companies should be for-profit businesses and anyone who tells you otherwise is needs a snack around. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but there are problems that nonprofits are better suited for and there are fellows that, um, that are, are tackling them. Uh, you know, we have, we've had fellows also join nonprofits as um, you know, like CFOs and whatnot as well. And of course, and Cheryl mentioned this earlier, the city of Detroit looms large as a character in this film. What are VFA fellowships like in, in other cities? 
what are the, some of the companies that are being started up in, say, San Antonio or St. Louis, where the energy is different, the city's at a, at a different stage of its life as well? Sure. You know, it, it's been awesome getting to know different cities and their personalities and the problems, the companies, the entrepreneurs. So uh, Detroit is singular mm -hmm. in the country and the Venture of America universe. Um, in St. Louis, there, there are some companies around uh, biotech out of Wash U, so that, that's interesting. In San Antonio, there's a guy named Graham Weston who founded Rackspace, and they're launching this whole uh, set of infrastructure companies. Um, but it, so every city we go to, there are different types of entrepreneurs solving different problems. It's one reason why innovation being centered in diverse geographies is so important because they just create different kinds of companies. It's like the Silicon Valley, certain type of company. New York, it's like, you know, fintech, media, fashion, et cetera. You go to San Antonio or St. Louis, they're not starting any of those types of companies. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, because the, the people that are coming out of industry there just have very different um, sets of issues they're trying to tackle. And Kate, you are not in Detroit now. You're in Colorado, right? You're right. in Boulder? Yep. Could you be doing what you do in any city? Uh, I actually think that there were better cities to start flocking. Um, but I do think that I could have done it in many cities. And the fact that it's, that it's taking off now, that our first actual paying client was in Cincinnati, the second will be in Boston, the third in San Francisco. I mean, we're living in a global interconnected world. So at this point, yeah, I mean, I could be in Alaska. I could be, in, I could be anywhere in starting flock. So it you would be harder, but. <laughs> what was the advantage of being in Detroit to, to start Women Rising? Um, you know, when I was in Detroit, there's a smaller technology scene there than there was in other cities in general. It's growing, and it's blossoming, and it's a beautiful thing to watch. But it's a smaller technology scene, and it was an even smaller women in technology scene. So when I came on the scene and was talking about starting Women Rising and bringing everyone together, there was so much support for it because there was already so much community, and so many people were already interconnected. And that was really valuable because if you were aiding that community, you could tap in and work with people very quickly. I think in very large cities where there's that less bonded, less close-knit, bigger communities, um, that would be a little harder. I think it would have gotten lost in the noise of everything going on. And now with Flock, which is the spin-off of Women Rising that I now run full time, I've talked to several people about expanding to San Francisco, and my friends in San Francisco have cautioned me many times, yeah, we know it's big, exciting, and there's a lot of stuff going on in San Francisco, but there's so much going on, it's really hard to distinguish. You're, you're a small fish in a big pond, as opposed to in Detroit, where I was a big fish in a small pond. So they're trying to warn you away from doing something in San Francisco. Yeah. You're better off looking for a city where tech and women are maybe not so prominent. I mean, who knows? I, I think that to be an entrepreneur, you have to believe that you're exceptional, because most startups fail. So if you don't believe you're exceptional, you'll never start anything. Mm -hmm. So I want to believe that I'll go to San Francisco and cut through the noise and do something completely different. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're offering is completely different, and it will stand out. But that is the caution that I'm getting from a lot of people out there. Labib, you said that you are now working full time at IPC. Um, you've put your startup on hold. So your parents are pretty happy with that, right? Yeah, they are. <laughs> um, I, you know, we don't, the, one of the main things that my parents, parents and I talk about now is kind of the little tidbits from my job and they're just so happy to hear that the company flies me places and I have a stable salary and I have health insurance. They're just very pumped about all of those things. Um, like my brother and I are moving in June and I was able to like, you know, cover all of the expenses and my brother didn't have to do anything and they're like very happy about that. There's a safety net at the, at the bottom of all of this. What have they learned about startups? Because watching you go through VFA in Detroit, watching you learn the hard lessons from working at Mason, I mean, they know a little bit more now. In the beginning, we hear your father talking about how, you know, 10% of startups actually make it. What do they think yeah, now? Yeah, so what's happened is I think technology as an industry and startups have just occupied an increasingly larger portion of the country's attention, including my parents. Um, and so now they're suddenly like, oh, like there are these tech companies that young people start and then they become successful and they make lots of money. Um, we would like you to do the same thing. And I was at, <laughs> I was at, I was at, I was at dinner with my mom last night, and uh, she's asking me, you know, like, 
when, when is your, when are you gonna start a company and sell it for, for a lot of money? When is that, <laughs> where is your exit? And I'm just like, I haven't even started this yet. Let's not, let's, let's, let's give it some time. So she's waiting for you to just make the decision that you're ready, right? Yeah, right. yeah, and presumably because it's my mom, you know, just like even though most startups fail because I started, of course mine will succeed, and it'll it'll you know it'll it'll work out for me. That's the assumption. Andrew, you started Ventures for America. Um, you recently stepped down. You're still on the board, of course. You're still the founder. What are you working on now? Uh, <laughs> so I'm the CEO until Labor Day. Okay. Um, uh, and then I'm, I'm writing a book right now about the impact of automation on the labor market. Um, so to, to give things away, it's not good. <laughs> um, and then how society should adapt to respond to that. Um, one of the things I, I've determined is that we're going to go through massive unprecedented changes and that, that struck me as like the highest challenge um, I could take on. Um, but Venture for America, I'm happy to say uh, my, my uh, longtime colleague is succeeding me as CEO, Amy Nelson. She's awesome. Uh, we're having a big party June 1st with Damon John from Shark Tank. We're headquartered here in New York, so anyone who wants to embrace Venture for America, you know, we're, we're uh, local in that way. And it's it's been the highest uh, highest achievement in my professional life to have worked with these people and and uh, everyone who's been part of Venture for America over this last number of years and. I have a pretty good track record of leaving and having people not miss me at all. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that, that that bears, you know, that holds true in this case too. Um, we talked a little bit about the startup ecosystem. Cheryl did early on in her introduction. How do you think that that has changed during the time that you've run Venture for America? Oh my it must gosh. it must look very different now than it did when you first started it. Yeah. So um, I've I've seen. Young people come of age. I've seen uh, startups develop in these cities. Um, I, I think that the trends around technology actually are, are still there's a there's a lot of discussion and hope that things will correct themselves in various ways. I actually am, I do not think that that's the case, and that uh, San Francisco will continue to attract a ton of the talent and money um, with New York and Boston and, and other places um, at the top tier, and. Uh, there's a lot of interest in helping women and, and uh, underrepresented minorities uh, become better represented in the entrepreneurship community, but there's a lot of work to be done there. It's not going to, in my opinion, happen on its own. It's going to take a lot of work. So the changes I've seen, um, it's like everything else in life where you see these awesome developments that have like, it's like you, you have children, I have children. Who has children? Children? All right. So it's like um, you see these incredible things happen with your children, and then you also get new things to worry about. And, right. uh, and that's what I've seen in, in these entrepreneurship systems, where you see kernels of value in these, these uh, things that are, are ready to take shape, but you, you also see trends that are um, very worrisome. Well, some, some would say the trends, um, among the trends that are worrisome are the current political climate. How do you guys feel, Kate, especially you, because you have this brand new company, uh, with this environment and, and moving forward? Do you feel like there's support for, for women who start their own company, or do you feel kind of under siege? Uh, maybe I'm putting words into your mouth. How do you feel? Uh, I am scared of what the changes represent in our culture. It worries me that, it worries me in general. Mm -hmm. I have seen in the small community that I live in of the front range of Colorado, Boulder and Denver, which is a very special area, um, I have seen people come out hard to support women and underrepresented minorities more. And that has been really promising to me. And that I think is not happening everywhere. But where I live, I have had so many people come out even stronger for women since the election. And it means so much to me. I mean, this is actually a great story. So a couple days after the election, I went to Starbucks and got a Frappuccino, and the barista gave it to me for free, because he was like, I have to do everything I can for women right now. <laughs> and I was like, yes. <laughs> it was the best thing. I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. And, and that's just, it's amazing. And it's such an interesting 
you know, I think that this is an example of how startups can be different, right? Of how like CEOs of startups can choose what values their culture represents within their company and choose to act on those values and choose to um, work with, you know, companies like Flock who are supporting and advancing women in technology um, and organizations like Venture for America who have 50-50 gender split and also a number of underrepresented minorities as well. I think that this is a time even more so for private companies and leaders of private companies to stand up and say, yeah, I see what's going on over there, but these are my values mm -hmm. and this is my company and these are the values that my company is going to act on. Libby, do you think when you do hit the pause button again and you resume your startup, it's going to be in New York or could it be somewhere else? Would you want it to be somewhere else? Maybe a red state, maybe take a bigger risk or would it be in the comfort of New York? Uh, it would absolutely be in the comfort of New York. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the 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 cognitive load of being a you know Muslim origin American uh, right now is is like it, it. I thought going through an airport and like just going through TSA was a nerve wracking experience for me before 2017. It is way way worse now. Um, you know, just thinking about. My digital privacy, are my devices going to get inspected and are they going to ask for my passwords and go through all of my texts? Um, am I going to get another call from my dad about an overt act of racism that he experienced just because he drove or cut someone off or someone, he took a parking spot that someone wanted and they just come and yell obscenities at him and tell him to get out of a country that he is a citizen of, has lived in for 20 plus years and pays taxes to. Um, it's just... <coughs> In New York, at least, a lot of those things are a lot less on my mind. Mm -hmm. And I need that in order to, starting a company is, is hard enough. Um, doing that while paying additional costs outside of the protective cover that um, being sort of a young college educated person in New York provides would be, would be even harder. Okay. And there's a, there's a degree of like physical uh, unsafety that I feel now in, in, in certain parts of America. Like I would not think about going and driving through, you know, empty parts of, of red states by myself. That's just fundamentally unaccessible to me in, in some way. All right, let's open uh, our panel up to questions from the audience. If you raise your hand, we have a gentleman here. A microphone is coming over to you. If you have a specific question for someone, direct it to them. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Varun. I'm an immigrant co-founder of a nonprofit startup. Um, and one of the reasons uh, that actually helps cities in America uh, we count potholes amongst other things. Uh, so one of the questions I have for Andy is, um, one of the reasons we chose to be a nonprofit is that we resisted the venture community, specifically from Silicon Valley and looking at TechCrunch and kind of a pretentious uh, celebration of failure. Uh, and this whole efficiency versus equity argument where you know venture seems to like efficiency and not equity as much. Uh, and this film, Thank You, Cheryl, has been a very open and transparent kind of peek into the entrepreneur's journey. What do you think the responsibility of the venture community is in this country to be open and transparent with their value systems? Wow, that's a Thank great you. question. So profound. Uh, it's, man, I'm friends with a lot of venture capitalists. For the most part, I like them. They're, you know, fine humans. Um, but bringing endorsement. But I, I, I think that uh, I think that that their job is their job, and then it makes it hard. All right. So I, you know, I've done some things. Blah blah blah. And like the the situation you can put someone in to see the worst in them is when they're responsible for someone else's money. If they're responsible for their own money and they invest in you and then it doesn't work out, they'll be like, oh, well, I screwed up, but you tried your best and here we are. <laughs> but if it's someone else's money, then they're like, oh man, I have to come after you to try and get like, you know, 50 cents on the dollar back because like that's like my LP's money and da 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 da. And then they're not allowed to own their er errors in judgment. It's like, then it's like, hey, I screwed up by investing in you, but now I'm gonna like drill you for, <laughs> like, like try to get that. So, uh, so their, their jobs are their jobs, their incentives are their incentives, and it makes it very, very hard for them to actually even express their values through resources because a lot of these funds have restrictions even on what they can do with the money. 
it's like, you know, it's like the LP's money. It's like I'm allowed to optimize for return and that's it. And so if I give you money, it's got to be some other money. So, the, the, so they're institutionally challenged in the ways you, you describe. Um, and I agree with you that, there, that that culture has become something of like an extreme version of itself that's been fed into by like a, you know, an overhyped press, an overheated press, and the, and, and the rest of it. Um, so I applaud you for what you're doing because you're immune to it. You can just try and do the work. Uh, I've, um, you know, Venture for America is a nonprofit. You guys have probably gathered that. And so I've, <laughs> so um, I too run a startup nonprofit. And it's, it's awesome to be able to do the work. It's a privilege. Um, and you see how being free of market incentives uh, like leads you to make very different types of decisions. I hope that that's helpful and answer the question somewhat. All right. mm -hmm. Next question. The gentleman over here. Um, this is for Kate and Labib. And so in watching a documentary, it seemed like a lot of the companies were more um, lifestyle companies in terms of people building something for their community and not necessarily a scalable company for venture capital, whatever it may be. How do you see those types of companies reshaping ecosystems that are downtrodden like Detroit versus when you talk about VC funded, scalable, large scale businesses? I think it takes both. I think it's good for investment in both to happen. I think it's important for the growth of the community to have huge startups that blow up and become the next Google, but also companies who are going to employ the factory workers up north like Bonza does. I think it's really valuable and important to have both. Yeah, I, I think the, the kind of valley ecosystem is a little over-indexed on the startup that's going to have this massive valuation and scale. Um, there are, I think, less risk, there are probably less risky opportunities with smaller companies, um, smaller returns, um, more localized effects, uh, but we don't have an ecosystem that's structured to invest in those companies. But I, th I think they're pretty promising and I wish there were more of them. Gentlemen over there. Uh, one of Labib's complaints in the film was how hard you were working and how many hours you were putting in and yeah. not having any equity. Um, and I mean, maybe the two of you can answer that in relation to the entire group. And then also, Andrew, for you, I mean, how do fellows feel? Is that a major concern or? Um, I don't. I don't have a good enough sample size of the entire fellow class to know how frequently this is a problem. You guys um, didn't talk about it amongst yourselves when you went to the bar? We did. So we did talk about it. And we talked about it in the context of the Detroit Fellows. And I was definitely, I definitely had the worst negotiation skills, worst outcomes of everybody. Because everyone else who was at an early stage company like I was um, had negotiated equity grants with their company. Um, and I was the only one who hadn't. And the rationale provided was we had a parent company that was you know, 10 years old, and we were owned by them, and therefore there was no equity, and the equity would materialize once we spun off. Um, you know, it, it didn't materialize, and, and I'm here today instead. Um, I, have, I have an N of like five on this, um, so I should, probably shouldn't extrapolate and like cast aspersions on like it, this being a gender thing again, but when like, the women fellows and I went out, we've never talked about equity. I can't remember a single equity conversation. So I, it never bothered me. I'd never had equity in Detroit and it never bothered me. And I got raises. That worked out. I got a lot of commission money once I started working in sales. But I never, I never had equity. Isn't part of being a startup, isn't part of that owning equity? Like being able to say that you own some part of that company? So, so on the Venture for America side, uh, it's very difficult for you to standardize uh, equity across like a large number of people. And so there, there is a salary minimum and commitment that companies make. Mm -hmm. um, but then we leave it to, because some companies are not going to be in positions to, to give equity. Um, some are. And so we, we do leave it to individual negotiations. The, the other thing is that the, the, start, the fellows, um, a lot of the times, this is going to be their first job out of school. And there is like a prove it period. <laughs> that um, you know, most people do go through. Um, though uh, you should, I mean, obviously, I think Labib. Uh, um, you know, if I had been your manager in that situation, I would have made sure you'd gotten something appropriate. Did you pick 
the company or did they pick you? How did that no, matchup I, I happen? Picked, I picked Mason very specifically. Okay. Um, I, I, I wanted to, because I was a product engineer in, in college, I studied biomedical engineering, the making of physical things, I really wanted to go work at a company where I made mm. physical things. And more specifically, I was even then kind of interested in the supply chain relationships between America and Asia, and I wanted to go deeper uh, along that axis. So Mason was an, was an interesting, uh, like actually a great opportunity, at least from a product and business perspective, for me to go to straight out of school. All right, final question from our audience. The lady in front, if we could get her a mic. How can you, like what kind of, like, why do you feel like the 20%, I think that was the percentage in the beginning of the, the documentary, um, we're in a data-driven um, building. Um, what are the, the reason why behind that, um, you can say, because you've seen so many, um, you know, obviously delegate and recipient. You mean the 20% that? Drop of uh, entrepreneur, yeah. I mean, it's actually more like a 50% drop in entrepreneurship um, among 18 to 30 year old households over the last uh, 20 years. Um, so you're asking why that drop has happened? Uh, yeah, why is that drop? Um, and, and personally, like, you know, how you've seen that. You know, I think there, there are so many reasons why like, young um, people... Qualitative, quali qualitative data and um, quantitative data. Like, yeah. So, so the, the, the quantitative reasons people would cite would be that, uh, that people graduate with higher levels of student debt today than they did in past years. So they, they're coming out with 30K on average and that's going to suppress business formation. They have lower rates of home ownership and people have traditionally used that as a source of money to start businesses. So those are like the, the quantitative reasons. The qualitative, which I personally believe in, is I, I think that we've set up something of this mad scramble among um, kids to get into this hyper-competitive college admissions process. And then by the time they get there, they're very, very um, burnt, out. burnt out and failure and risk averse. I mean, kids have told me in college, it's like, you know, the goals is not to fail. Um, you know, I, I sure wish I had time to think. And you, you think like, aren't you in college? Isn't that all you guys do? But, um, but you know, so there's like, a, um, so that there's like this, uh, this culture that does not encourage risk taking. Um, you know, I actually, like I started my first company before social media came about. Um, and so I think social media might make it harder too because like your failures are more public. Like, you know, like, I mean, like failure is hard enough without everyone you know, like watching it in real time. So, um, and commenting. Yeah, so I think there are, there are I, I also think that the internet, I mean, people hype it up as like this, like everyone can start a business thing. I mean, uh, it is so much harder to start all sorts of businesses now than it was a generation ago. Like you look at someone like Kevin Plank who started Under Armour, his first business in college was a flower selling business, uh, Cupid's Flowers. Can, you know, uh, and today you can never start that, that business because there's like 1-800-Flowers there is going to undercut you and there's like, you know, some instant delivery service and it doesn't need to make money. So you know, like you're getting rid of this whole layer of businesses that end up forming the next generation of serial entrepreneur um, that, that never gets out the gate. So there are a lot of reasons, in my opinion, um, why young people aren't starting businesses as much. All right. After I was so encouraging just then. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the book's about how we have tons of talent doing certain things and not other things. Um, and it's about the ideas behind Venture for America. Uh, and I, I like to think it's a relatively honest account of why so many of us do the things we do. Um, but, but we do need people taking on the challenge of building things. And I'm living proof, and I think Labib and Kate, in my opinion, are as well, and many others, Cheryl, Brian, that if you take on challenges that are bigger than yourself, uh, amazing things do get built. Uh, they, they do happen. I started Venture for America with, you know, I put in 120 k of my own. Our budget was 200000 that year. Um, so it was like me and some friends I guilt tripped. It was like, don't you love America? And they were like, <laughs> you know, I love America for $10,000. So, um, but, and, and then this year our budget's like six and a half million. Uh, you know, we have like 1,500 applicants from around the country. Like in year one, it was like me and the PowerPoint deck going to college campuses being like, don't you want to, don't you love entrepreneurship? You guys don't remember these days. So, uh, so if you decide to commit to something, there, we live in an era where there's such a hunger and thirst for genuine heart, soul commitment. And then if you show that, people will get excited about it and rally behind it. And I'm living proof of that. Cheryl is, Labib, Kate. Um, so that's why smart people should build things. 
All right, thank you so much to our panelists, Andrew Yang, Kate Caitlin, and Libby Raman. One more note, I just wanted to mention, um, for those of you who've been coming to the Cornell Tech at Bloomberg Speaker Series, mark your calendars because the next event is June 20th. I'll be speaking with Brian Cohen. He's the chairman of New York Angels, and he'll be here once again at Bloomberg. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great evening.